life. Infinitely fragile, and yet often deceptively mundane, somehow in the same space. Or more like the same time. Time. The most precious currency we have, no matter how hard a bargain you drive, you can never get it back. We trade it for people and power and things, hoping that in the end we'll understand what it means to live. But sometimes the end is a surprise. One we couldn't predict or expect, regardless of all our calendars and notifications, there are still some things beyond the reach of our front right pocket. So, if the author of time and of space stood before you today, and with the words of his son, he told you that your soul was required of you, not this night, but in 35 minutes. If your heart was laid down in its proverbial deathbed and you had this one final opportunity to leave a word of wisdom and of passion with those you loved most, what message would burn inside you worth the finite breaths and fleeting moments you have left? Good morning, everyone. We're humbled and honored to be delivering the word today. Today, everyone will receive a double portion. This will be a tag team message. Two deathbed messages, two preachers, and too little time. My name is Logan Zan Hughes, and I was an atheist for most of my life until 2016 on Easter Sunday when I received the Holy Spirit and was born again. Right over there. Since that moment, I've been sold out for Jesus and I serve him passionately with all that I am. I now serve here on staff over the youth ministry with my beautiful wife, Kate, and my soon-to-be baby daughter, Selah. Amen. My name is Zach. Um, I serve here at the church also over the, with, the young, with the young adults. Um, a little bit about me is I grew up actually going to church uh, for mo- the first part of my life, and um, I stepped away, stepped out of the church when I was about 15, and ran away from God and, and ran into the world, and uh, didn't want anything to do with him for many years uh, until uh, back in 2016, my beautiful mom over there, she relentlessly invited me back to church again and again until finally I came and I was encountered by God January 22nd, 2016 here at Heart of the City Church also, and, and I've been chasing after him ever since. And so I also am just very humbled to be able to give you the word today. Um, I want to tell a quick joke. On. The one last night didn't land at all, so I, uh, I found another one, Jamie, don't worry. <laughs> So a preacher was completing a temperance sermon, and with great expression, he said, if I had all the beer in the world, I'd take it and I'd throw it in the river. With even greater emphasis, he said, and if I had all the wine in the world, I'd take it and throw it in the river. And then finally, he said, and if I had all the whiskey in the world, I'd take it and throw it in the river. And he sat down. The song leader then very cautiously stood up and announced with a pleasant smile, For our closing song, let us sing hymn number 365, Shall We Gather at the River. Now, we're not going to gather at the river today, but we will be gathering at the lake for baptisms afterwards. So would you guys bow your heads and pray with me? Father, we thank you that we get to have fun in church, God, that this is a, a celebration of what you've done for us, Lord. But I pray, God, that we would, we would we'd be so intentional with our words, Logan and myself, and God, that if anything that we say isn't come from the truth of your word and from your spirit, that it would fall to the ground. God, that you would open hearts and minds and that you would change us from the inside out. Holy Spirit, we need you to come and be present here. Speak through us now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So it being our deathbed message, you know, I, I just thought it was fitting, fitting that, you know, Logan and I could share a little bit of our testimonies and where we came from because that's truly why we're here today and we wouldn't be who or where we are without what God has done in our life. 
and we, we want to be funny and try to make you laugh at the same time because, honestly, uh, we, we have so much to be joyful for. We have so much to be thankful for, and we have so much to celebrate. But more than anything, I would want to leave you with the word if this truly were my last few minutes on earth. And so I'm going to jump right into it. I'm going to be reading out of chapter uh, 15 of John, the book of John, chapter 15. I'm going to read verse 1 through 10, and then I'm going to skip down a little bit and read the last two verses. So, starting in verse 1, it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be given to you. It shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then in verse 26, it says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear witness of me, because you have been with me from the beginning." I, uh, when I first got saved, I started meeting up with J.O. Uh, uh, pretty occasionally, pretty regularly. And um, we used to meet up at Jamba Juice. And I remember one of the first times I met up with him, uh, he asked me this question. He said, Zach, what would you do if I said you're preaching this weekend? And at the time, of course, it was uh, hypothetical because I'd never preached fr from a stage or from a sermon or from a pulpit before um, or prophetic, if that's how you want to look at it. It's kind of how it was. And um, he asked me that. And I said, honestly, I would, I would go home and I would spend 12 hours on my face probably um, seeking God. And he said, exactly. That, that's the proper response. That's what you would do is you would seek God. And here we are four years later. And um, they've asked Logan and I to share in this deathbed series. And... Um, you know, they said, this is what you would say with the last few minutes of your life. This is the thing that should be burning on your heart that you're most passionate about. And they said, honestly, you, you shouldn't even need notes. You should be able to just get up there and do it. And uh, I was like, when they asked me that, I knew immediately that it was going to be John 15 that I would preach out of. But honestly, I said, God, I don't, I don't know how to preach this. I don't know how to preach out of this. Have you ever had something that's just like in your guts and in your spirit and it's like it's so in you but you don't know how to like express it? You don't know how to like share it? And that, that's how it was for me and I began wrestling with God and uh, you know, John is looked at as like the most poetic of the four gospels and Jesus is just spitting straight poetry in this chapter and what he's saying is it's beautiful and it's kind of mysterious and it's profound and I was just like, God, I don't, I don't know how to expound on this anymore. It's already your words. It's already so perfect. And I began to wrestle with him and really seek him and say, God, how do, how do I make this any more than it already is? And as I was wrestling, it finally hit me. And he said, exactly. What, what you're doing right now is the point of the chapter. See, I need you to practice what you're preaching. I need, I, some things are better caught than taught. And I need you to see your need for me. I need to remind you of your need for me. And I need to align myself with the presence of God and, and see that just like it says in verse four, abide in me and I will abide in you. Abide in me and I will abide in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And I think today a lot of people are just picking the fruit of those around them instead of abiding in the vine and allowing God to produce fruit in them. And I think a reason that a lot that we're not seeing a lot more souls come to Christ is because we have an army of Christians that are saying it's not about religion, it's about relationship which is true, but when they have no relationship with the Father behind closed doors, then what they say is powerless because there's no intimacy, there's no power with it. You might say, how do you know there's no power with it? Because the fruit of their life will show it. The fruit of their life will show it. Jesus said that we judge a tree by the fruit that it bears. So how do we live a life that's pleasing to God and that bears fruit? Abide in him and he will abide in you. See, earlier Jesus actually says, 
He says that all of the law rests on these two commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And to what? Love your neighbor as yourself. But see, he first loved us. So the only way that we can love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, our strength, and all our mind and love our neighbor as ourselves is if we abide in his love, see? And, and, and so this isn't so much about me giving you practical takeaways because if this was my real, really my deathbed message, I don't think I'd be able to think of practical takeaways. So like J.O. says, I just want you to catch the spirit of it. And if you want anything practical, it's simply this. If you want to know how to abide in the vine, all you have to do is this. You can write this down. Pray and read your Bible and sometimes even fast. I know it's simple, but it's not easy. Pray, read your Bible, and sometimes even fast. If there's anything that I want you to take away from today, it's, it's a hunger for the word and for the presence of God. John 6, 56, it says, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. It's a pretty radical statement that Jesus says. You know, before I had that meeting with J.O. at that Jamba Juice, I had just gotten back from a conference that I went to with some friends over in Seattle called Power and Love. It's actually the title of Logan and I's deathbed message together. And um, basically what it is, it's just this empowerment conference to empower people in their identity in Christ and to go out and to evangelize in whatever capacity that they're in in life. And on the last day of the conference, they have this thing called a fire tunnel where all the pastors and leaders would kind of line up at the altar and it would kind of lead out into the, into the lobby and everybody would come through and they would kind of lay hands on them and commission them out into the world and people would get filled with the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues, just get slain, all kinds of just crazy things. And I, I was in line and there's about 1,200 people or so at this conference. And so I'm in line for at least an hour. I'm just kind of talking to God and praying. And I'm like, God, you know, I, I don't need some crazy manifestation. Like I just, I have your spirit in me already. I have, I have your fire. And man, if anything, just give me a hunger for your word. I just want to hunger for your word, God. That, that's all. I see these people that, that, that are just so passionate about you and hungry for you, and I, I just want that, God. And so I, I finally, it's my turn, and I, I walk through the line, and you kind of just like walk through, and everybody lays hands on you, and Todd White, this crazy evangelist dude, I, I call him like J.O. with dreads, basically. Um, I go through the line, and um, he even lays hands on me, and he says something like, as soon as he lays his hands on me, he's like, that's weird. And I didn't know why he said, I'm just like, you're weird. I don't know. What does that mean? <laughs> and I'm like stepping over people out in the lobby and there's people like strewn out everywhere. And I didn't feel anything, but this guy, he walks up to me. I'd never seen him before. And he points his finger at me and he says, son, I just want to let you know, God's putting a hunger for the word inside you. And I was like, what? I just prayed that an hour ago. He said, well, he just wanted to confirm it in you. And so leave the conference, we go home the next day and I get, I get back in town and I stop at Sowers and I get my first hardback black ESV Bible. It's got a little strap on it and I, I, I just begin to devour it just day in and day out. I just start scribbling all, scribbling all over the pages, took it everywhere with me. It got all beat up on the outside. By the way, if anybody's found it, please return it to me because I lost it about six, seven months ago and I really want it back because I was gonna give it to my daughter when she's older. But anyways, I'm trying to get over it. Um, and I just began to devour it and it started to feed me and, and it started to fill me and I, I relied on it. And I love what Craig said in his message that to die to yourself and to live to him is the only reasonable response that there is when you see who God really is and you encounter him for his love. But the only way to sustain that encounter is by turning your response into relationship. And the only way you can do that is by abiding in the vine. That word abide means to remain in him to remain in the Lord himself. His presence is the source of power that gives us uh, everything that we have to be able to preach, to be able to prophesy, to be able to walk out what he's called us to. And as Christians, we're meant to plug into that power through intimacy with the Holy Spirit. That's why God tried to get our attention covenant after covenant. He tried to get man's attention because he desperately wanted intimate relationship with him. And so he sent his son to die for us. And before his son died, he said, it's better for you that I go because when I do, I'm gonna send the helper, the Holy Spirit, and he's gonna give you what you need to, to enter in. So he had to do what he did so that we could do what we're called to do. Yeah, come on. Last thing, as I was studying I felt the Holy Spirit lead me to research a couple things. And I felt like he told me to research the crucifixion of Jesus. 
And I felt like he told me to specifically to look more into what, what the, the Roman crucifixion looked like in that time. And what, I realized something pretty interesting, and I don't want you to just hear, hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying that this is undoubtedly the absolute truth. You can do your own research. But what I found that was pretty interesting is, for one, the word cross doesn't actually mean what you think it means, probably. It, it, in, the, in the ancient language in Greek, it means sta, staros, which is uh, basically just a stake in the ground. So... Um, the Romans had different ways of crucifying people. Sometimes it looked like an X. Sometimes it looked like more of like a T shape. Sometimes it looked like we kind of pictured the cross looking. But what I found is that most likely the kind of cross that was used in the time that Jesus was crucified was more of like a T shape. And then, of course, there was the inscription on the top that read Jesus, King of the Jews, which was, of course, to kind of ridicule and humiliate him. But I even began looking at these, these old paintings of people that were, you know, closer to that time than we are. How many of you know we kind of look at Jesus as this white-skinned, blue-eyed, long, silky hair kind of guy, and that's probably not the case. And so I just want you to go with me in the same way. I started looking at these older paintings, and I found this kind of 14th century painting of, of what it looked like when Jesus was on the cross and, and what others, a lot of which look like, kind of like this. More of this, like, kind of T-shape. And I said, God, why does, that, why does that matter? Why did you bring me to that? And I was thinking, you know, Jesus, whenever he taught, whenever he told parables, he would, he, would, he would typically relate what he was saying to something that was culturally relevant or that would kind of hit home for them at the time. You know what I mean? Like he, he would make it something that had to do with their time period that they were in. And so Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. And he was talking about a vine that was used to make grapes for wine production, right? Because it was very, very popular at the time. And I said, why did, okay, so what, what is, what's the connection here? And so I began to study, what, what do vines look like? And I found that there's somewhat of a resemblance. Isn't that interesting? Man ate from a living tree and it brought death into the world. Jesus died on a dead tree and it brought life. And Jesus said that the Son of Man had to be lifted up so that he could draw a man to himself. And he said, it's better for you that I go because when I do, I'm going to send the helper. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to call you to bear your cross and follow me, to pick it up and follow me. But the only way that you can bear the burden of the cross is by continuing to abide in the vine. And the only way you're going to turn your, resp your, your response into relationship is by turning that encounter into a continual encounter, by continuing to abide in him. And he says, I'll be with you from now and forever. Can we all please close our eyes? I want for a minute for everyone just to listen and imagine. Listen and imagine. This is based on true events, an historical and graphic account. The year is 63 AD. You're in Rome during the reign of Emperor Nero. After many years of declaring the good news of Jesus and spreading his gospel across the land, you are once again in cold iron shackles, imprisoned with the possible outcome of death. Imagine you're being kept in a dark dungeon deep beneath the streets of Rome. It's cold, wet, and you barely have any clothes to keep you warm. Your body hurts. Open wounds across your back from lashing after lashing after lashing. You're of old age now and your eyes have grown dim. Most have abandoned you. In the streets you hear screams as your brothers and sisters in the faith are being covered in tar and burned alive at the stake, lighting the street at night as Roman candles. In the distance is Nero's circus, you hear lions and bears 
growling and snarling as they tear apart captured Christians limb by limb simply for their faith in Jesus. These may be your final days, your final moments, your last words. Luke has come once more to scribe a letter for you. The room is now lit by the light of his candle as he prepares, not knowing that these will be the last words from your mouth. This is the story of Paul as he writes his final letter to his faithful son, Timothy. You may open your eyes. 2 Timothy chapter 4 says this, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap to themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demaeus has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed from Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia and Titus for Domanche. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And to Cheekies I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Trios, when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. I'm gonna skip down to 16. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are Paul's final words. His final moments. In a time of suffering that we cannot understand. We're in a country that's more concerned about masks and mandates, stressed out and filled with anxiety and panic. And our focus should be on the gospel. We read of a man that's literally hearing his brothers and sisters crying for help in the streets as they're lit on fire as candles to light the streets at night. And we're bickering about masks and all the other things. So if I was gonna die in just a couple minutes, these would be the words that I would want you to know. If there was one thing you could remember about me, it would be the final words of Paul in his very last moments you would say his deathbed message. 
So I wanna share some takeaways with you that I live by and I've written upon my heart since the day I gave my life to Jesus. Number one, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. It is not up to me and J.O. and Zach to just be the ones preaching. It's for each and every one of us. And not to take weeks to study a sermon and have a pulpit and have a stage, but to be ready in season and out of season, to give an account for the hope that resides within each and every one of us. To preach the word, to always be ready to give an account. Number two, to convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. I think some of us need, be, need to be more susceptible to, to brothers and sisters speaking into our lives. To hold one another accountable in our actions. To help one another along on this journey. But don't think you can do it without relationship. Uh-uh. If you want to rebuke somebody, you best have a relationship with them or they will not receive it. So Paul teaches us very clearly to convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering, to long suffer with one another and teaching. Number three, to endure sound doctrine. Base your faith upon the word. If it does not line up with the word, it does not line up with God. I'll say it over here. If it does not line up with the word, it does not line up with God. Then why are we a society today that wants to add to an already complete gospel? This is the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you want to know how to live your life, open your Bibles. For 2,000 years, it's been correct and full of truth. Turn on the TV and you will find none of that. Number four, endure afflictions. Okay, everybody buckle up. I'm gonna burst your bubble real quick. Okay, you guys ready? Life won't be easy. I love you, youth, but life won't be easy. Prepare your hearts. Okay? Okay? Prepare for hard times. You know, I had a pretty terrible life before I found Jesus and I suffered a lot of afflictions, most of them, most of them self-inflicted. And just because I raised my hand and opened my heart to Jesus and was born again, it doesn't mean that, that the trials, the tribulations didn't keep coming my way. I just now know where to look for my hope and my strength. And those cannot be taken away from me like the world would try to do to us. The world wants you to be in fear, to have anxiety, to be stressed out. I refuse. My strength is found in the King of Kings, in the Lord of Lords. Endure afflictions. Number five, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Here's what I think most of the church is saying. Let the evangelist do the work and I'll go over here and fulfill my ministry. But see, that is not the gospel. God has called each and every one of us to fulfill a ministry purpose, to be a specific part of the body. But the actual way to fulfill that calling is to do the work of an evangelist. To talk to the barista when you get your coffee. To talk to the co-worker that's lost and broken. To stop on the side of the road to the homeless person that has nothing. And tell them the hope that lives within you. If you desire to fulfill your ministry focus in your life, I encourage you to start with winning souls for Jesus. It is not just my job. It is all of our jobs to do the work of the evangelists to fulfill our ministry. Number six, 
Number six, fight the good fight. Finish the race and keep the faith. See, I respect authorities. It tells us to in the Bible. I'll wear a mask if I have to. I'll stay at home during a stay at home order if I have to. And I'll listen to the authorities above me. But if one day they say I cannot preach the word from this gospel, I will not bow down. I will not let this world take away my faith and take away that hope that resides within each and every one of us. I will fight the good fight. Finish the race well. And if I were to die in two minutes, I know that I have run the race well. Number seven, let your peace and comfort be found in his word. This is my favorite piece of the scripture. This is in verse 13. Paul says this, bring the cloak that I left when you come and the books, especially the parchments. Paul knows he's about to be martyred. Just days after writing this, he's decapitated. And what is the final and only thing he asked for? He says, they took me so quickly. I didn't even have time to put a jacket on. I'm in a dungeon and I'm cold. So bring me a jacket and bring me the word of God. Bring me my parchments in my books so that I can spend time with him before I'm gone. Is that your concern? Is your concern to make sure that you spend time with him every day in his word? If you were to die today, how much time have you given the Father? Number eight, don't hold offense in your heart. Don't do it. Verse 16, Paul says this, at my first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. But check this out. He says, may it not be charged against them. I would submit to you today that most of us in this room hold offense in our hearts to at least one person. I know I do. It's a struggle for all of us. And when Paul's about to die and he's in a dungeon and he hears all of his brothers and sisters being killed in the streets, he says, Lord, forgive them. Very reminiscent of Jesus. Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do not hold offense in your heart, brothers and sisters. Number nine, lean on the Lord's strength. In verse 17, he says, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. He's had everything stripped away from him. Most say that he would have been so crippled and hunched over from so many lashings across his back that he could barely walk. His eyes had grown so dim that he couldn't even write his letters. Luke would have to come to write them. But he knew where his strength resided and one that could not be taken away. If the world's making you feel weak right now, turn to your strength. Turn to our God, our Father, the King of Kings, the ultimate strength in this world. Number 10, know that the Lord will deliver you, or know that the Lord is our deliverance. I know where I'm going, do you? Do you? The Lord is our deliverance. No matter what crazy things going on in our world, think about it. It's nothing compared to what these people went through. So in closing, the pandemic, the stay at home order, the panic that has swept across this country are honestly nothing compared to the suffering and trials of the first century church and Paul. The masks, the mandates cannot stop the gospel. So, you're not in the streets, you're not covered in tar, and you're not on fire. You're not in a coliseum, and you're not getting torn apart and eaten by a bear. 
So why in the world are we not living out the fullness of the gospel every day of our lives? Paul has called us and God has called us to preach the word, to hold each other accountable with all long suffering and teaching, to endure sound doctrine, to endure the afflictions around us and to prepare for them, to do the work of an evangelist and fulfill our ministry, to remain in his word, to forgive and not hold offense, to lean on the Lord and know that he is our deliverance. Can we all bow our head and close our eyes? I want to give you an opportunity. There's two people I want to talk to. The first group, if you've heard these words today and you've had a conviction in your heart and you want this fullness, you want to live out the gospel the way that it's been expressed, that you want to abide in the vine, I want to encourage you today in your heart. I just want to pray for you. You don't have to raise your hands. Father God, all across this room, Lord, God, I pray for each and every person here that has had a conviction in their heart during this message. Lord, that they would be able to fulfill their ministry and to do the work of an evangelist, to share the gospel with those that are lost around them. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe today you're saying, you don't know this Jesus that we've been talking about. You don't know about this hope that resides in my heart. The hope that four or five years ago changed everything. That took a, a, a drug addict off the streets to a preacher on a pulpit. Then God doesn't want just your hand today to raise. He wants you to open your heart to him. He doesn't just want your commitment today, but he wants your conversion. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you have not given your life to Jesus yet and walked into relationship with him or you need to recommit your life to him and get back on the right track, I want to give you that opportunity right now. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, if that's you, just throw your hand up real quick. I see that hand. I see that hand. Hallelujah. I see that hand. Hallelujah. I see that hand. I see that hand at the back. Thank you. Hallelujah. Oh, church family, can we celebrate? <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This is what it's all about. I could care less about a microphone or a pulpit or a stage. It's all about souls. It's all about the lost. This is what we're here for right now. If that was you today, I just want you to know how happy I am for you. You have the same hope that relies within my heart. And I hope you're encouraged today. If that was you, there's gonna be some people back at the banner booth over here. They would love to connect with you. They're on each side. They'd love to connect with you and tell you more and help you on this journey. This is just the start of your journey. Let us help you run the race well. Amen. Would you guys stand with me today? Just in closing, I just felt prompted to um, pray specifically for um, just the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I haven't done this in any other gathering. I felt the Holy Spirit specifically say that he wants me to pray for it at this gathering. And, um, you know, maybe it's a little different right now. We can't lay hands on everybody. We can't have a fire tunnel leading out into the lobby. But, uh, you know, in Acts, it says that as Peter spoke, the Holy Spirit fell on, on those. So I believe if, if that's you today, if you'd say, Man, I, I know I'm, even if you're saved, I know I'm saved. I know I have the seal of my salvation, but I need to be filled to overflow. If that's you, I just want to uh, just invite you to receive it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to strive. It, it's a free gift. And so just, just real quick, one more time, we're just gonna pray together. If everyone would just, just bow their heads just out of uh, eliminating distractions. And if you want, you can raise, you can not raise your hand, but just kind of put it out in front of you like you're receiving a gift or Whatever you need to do just to, to posture your heart towards the Lord. And I'm just gonna pray for you. And as I'm praying, I just want you in your heart or with your mouth or both to just begin to ask God to fill you. Begin to ask Holy Spirit to just come and fill you either for the first time or again. 
because I'm gonna let you know there is always more of him. He is infinite, he's everlasting. And so God, I just thank you right now that not by the power of my words or the eloquency of my speech, but only by your spirit. God, I thank you that you would come and begin to touch people now. Holy Spirit, you would come and you would begin to fill people either for the first time or the hundredth time, God, that we will always need you. You say, be filled, be continue to be filled. And so Holy Spirit, we welcome you right now. God, I thank you for the hungry heart that would be filled right now. In Jesus' name, God, we pray for more right now, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.